Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Devo for the week. This week, we are studying the book of Judges. And uh, as you heard from uh, Nate Southwick, the uh, survey of the book, there are a lot of things in this book that are uh, uh, really great to study and to dig into and to understand. Uh, tonight, I, I want to do uh, for the Devo just a, a short uh, overview of the, the person of Gideon. There really, in my view anyway, there are two um, judges that stand out above the others and probably are the most famous and that is Gideon and Samson. And if you've been part of a Sunday school uh, throughout your lifetime and you've gotten to be able to, to uh, learn these, both of them are uh, wonderful stories of God's greatness, of his power, uh, and of man's humanity at the same time. And uh, as we look at these uh, this character tonight of Gideon, I, uh, I want us to be able to think about both God's work and uh, the humanity of man. To me, one of the, the testimonies of why the Bible is authoritative, uh, why it is inspired by God, why it is uh, such an unusual book, is that it covers material that is so real uh, and certainly as we'll see tonight in the life of Gideon, uh, a, a, who, a man who was a very real man. So uh, let's just bow our heads and ask the Holy Spirit to help us tonight as we look at his word. Father, as we look into your word tonight, we pray that your Holy Spirit would open these truths to our hearts and to our minds that we may see and hear the voice of God as, as you speak to us through your word. We say this in Jesus' name, amen. So Judges, of course, is a book that uh, takes place after the death of Moses, after the death of Joshua, two great leaders uh, Moses, of course, leading the children out of bondage in Egypt. Joshua being the God's appointed one to lead them into the promised land. Uh, both of them men of great faith and both of them uh, men who trusted uh, God and, and to whom God spoke and, and gave them uh, direction. This period of Judges, as you know from the survey, is a barren period uh, in the history of Israel. Uh, several centuries, really three centuries or more, that pass during this period of time. And in that period of time, uh, there is a great rebellion and opposition from God's people toward God himself. They are uh, idolaters and they worship idols of the peoples who are around them. And for that reason, God gives them over for periods of time to experience the oppression of sinful men uh, and chooses not to deliver them uh, from that except for these people whom he appoints as judges and uh, as we look at the Judge Gideon, uh, we'll pick up in uh, chapter 6 and, and uh, verse 11 here. And uh, uh, reading now from, from the scriptures, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, 
If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. So this is the next in a list of oppressive nations, kings, uh, that God has surrendered his people to for a time in order for them to work. We know from uh, earlier in the book of Judges that during this period of time, uh, the Israelites have been so oppressed by Midian that they run to the hills. The Midianites are uh, basically nomadic peoples who moved around in the area to the east of the Jordan River. And as they came to the season of harvest, they made sure that they moved back into the land of Israel that they may take from the crop, the yields of crops that the Israelites had planned, of, of course, for themselves. And so uh, we have something here that in my mind is similar to uh, the 1998 animated film called A Bug's Life. Uh, many of you have seen that, perhaps most of you, but you recall that uh, because of the work that the ants had done to store up all of their food for the winter time, and because of an impetuous uh, young ant, they had lost that uh, crop. And because of the uh, uh, practice that the their enemies, the grasshoppers, and one in particular, a villain named Hopper, uh, would come back and require everything that the ants were to give them as a gift. And in many respects, I think you have in the Midianites people who were doing what is very similar to what the grasshoppers were doing to the ants in that animated film, A Bug's Life. But God calls in this particular instance a young man by the name of Gideon to be the next judge who would uh, really save uh, God's people. And so uh, let's look then at... Uh, uh, Verse 11 uh, through 13, again, we, we just read uh, these verses. The angel of the Lord here, it says, came and sat under the terebinth. Now, who is the angel of the Lord? Angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate uh, uh, coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are a number of them throughout the Old Testament. Whenever you see the phrase, the angel of the Lord, uh, you can be pretty sure that that angel of the Lord uh, is the Lord Jesus Christ in a, a incarnate appearance that is prior, of course, to his incarnation uh, that we experience in the New Testament. Um, so the angel of the Lord, uh, and, and of course Gideon not knowing who this man is, assuming that he's a stranger, a sojourner who's wandering through and sits under this tree, this terebinth tree, probably to uh, gain some respite from the heat, uh, to enjoy the shade of the tree. And he sees Gideon uh, working here. And uh, Gideon, of, of what you might suspect from any young man who's uh, helping his father and, and working on the family farm, in a wine press, which has large sides to it, and in the wine press, which is far too small to uh, take care of an entire crop of grain, Gideon has taken the wheat from the fields 
put it into the, to the wine press and there he is threshing it out rather than on the threshing floor, which would have been in a high place where everyone could see uh, from miles around. And Gideon is doing this uh, because he is afraid that he's going to be seen and he's doing it for the family to have some of their own food and sustenance that they've grown so that through this period of time when the Midianites come, they will have something to eat. And uh, the angel of the Lord, verse 12, says to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. I want us to look at four lessons from this story that uh, we can take away as something helpful and beneficial, I, I trust, to us. And this is the first. Lesson number one is that uh, God sees what we don't. When God comes to us, when he speaks to us, just as he spoke to Gideon, God is seeing uh, us, just as he saw Gideon, not in the eyes of the one who sees what is, but in, from the eyes of the one who sees what is yet to be and what is yet to come. And um, so he, he sees this uh, man whom we can describe as fearful, uh, very discouraged, uh, quite self-centered, uh, beating out this grain, thinking about his own needs and those of his family. And uh, the Lord God, who is seeing this man as a mighty man of valor. So the angel of the Lord appears to him and says to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why have all these things happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? And uh, so there's, there's some things here that you really need to be able to see from the scriptures. And I hope you have your scriptures open tonight. In verse 12, it is the angel of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Whenever we see that word, we know that it is a reference to Yahweh. It is the God of the Old Testament, it is the God of the New Testament. He is the one who is the creator. He is almighty God. He is the everlasting father. Uh, he is uh, who he is. And, and yet when Gideon replies to him, he says, please, my Lord, small letter L, small letter O, R, and D. Um, there are three uses of the word Lord and in this sentence, uh, we see uh, two of those. Please, my Lord, basically saying to him, uh, my friend, please, my friend, who has just called him a mighty man of valor. Uh, and, and we would probably say something like this today. You got to be kidding me, friend. That's kind of the Im inference that... Uh, we can draw from this just in the spelling of the word Lord. He recognizes, because he says, if the Lord is with us, he recognizes that Yahweh is the Lord God and the one who has rescued his people from bondage in Egypt and recounts that to this man whom he doesn't recognize yet as God himself the Lord Jesus Christ, but he does remind him of what God has done for his, his people. So um, there are excuses in this. Well, we see in 
verse 15. He says, uh, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? How can I be the one that you are calling, in verse 14 here, to save your people? Go in the might of yours, this might of yours, and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Again, God, you've got to be kidding me. What, what is it that I can do? And then he goes on to give all the excuses why he's not the one or couldn't be the one that God is calling. He says, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and, and I am the least in my father's household. Now, Manasseh was not the largest tribe. In fact, it was the smallest tribe of the Israel. And among the smallest tribe of Israel, Gideon is saying, I am the least in my clan, which is the least in the tribe of Manasseh. It's like the littlest of the little of the little. <laughs> Uh, so that's his excuse that he gives to God. If you, uh, if you want to just turn over to verse 27 uh, of this chapter, you'll see another thing that Gideon does in addition to excuses, and that is once he has agreed that it is God who is the one who's challenging him to do this, and he has been talking with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, uh, Yahweh. He says, so Gideon uh, took 10 of his servants to do as the Lord had told him, but because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. So we have a, a fearful man who is much like we are, when called upon to do something much greater than we see ourselves being capable of doing, uh, whom God sees as being capable, but, but we don't, that's kind of the first lesson that we, we want to see here uh, in the life of Gideon. God sees, he sees in us what we don't see, with all of our excuses, our compromises, the things that we come up at with as reasons why we can't. God knows full well if he's called us in his uh, heart and mind knows that we are capable. Well, second lesson uh, that I want to point out to us here uh, is that God requires obedience and worship before he empowers us to act. Ultimately, in this account of Gideon, Gideon is victorious and does free Israel from the Midianites and is a indeed a mighty warrior. There's no question as you read this story how and why Gideon is successful uh, like he is. But at this particular point, um, there is more that needs to be done before Gideon is ready to actually do the things that God is looking uh, for him to do. So let's look at uh, chapter 6 and verses 19 uh, through 22. So Gideon went into his house after he realizes that uh, this man is exceptional in some way. And he sees him and calls him Lord, capital L-O-R-D, or the word for master. So he's gone from friend to master in Gideon's mind. And he says, uh, uh, Gideon goes into his house knowing that the proper thing for him to do as a host is to prepare a meal for this man. And he goes and prepares a young goat and unleavened cake uh, from an ephah of flour. That's about a half bushel of, of flour. So he's making a lot of cakes 
and he's killed a young goat and it takes him some time to do this. All this time, God is showing his loving kindness, his steadfast uh, opinion of Gideon and he's willing to wait for Gideon to prepare this meal. Let's continue. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of the Lord uh, said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Now here's the first evidence, I believe, that we have of Gideon being a man who is a man of faith. Can you imagine spending all the time preparing this meal, this young goat, having broth, probably more than what's needed for one person, and probably thinking what this one person doesn't eat, the rest of my family can eat, uh, and, and taking it and pouring it over the meat. So he's, he's trusting for the first time that this man has something to say to him that is, is of importance. And, uh, and he did so, verse 21, and the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes and the fire sprang up from, or fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord and said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. For many of us, that would have been sufficient. A wow moment. Wow, this man who wandered into my, my home area here where I'm working is the Lord God. He is the angel of the Lord and I have seen him uh, face to face. But that's not what the Lord is really requiring. Um, for if you uh, skip down to verse 25, that night the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. For a sacrificial a stone, stones to be put together on an acceptable sacrifice altar, uh, they had to be laid in a certain way or in a certain direction. On the other hand, before there was any uh, sacrifice to be made, the Baal God had to be destroyed. And, uh, and then there were poles, there were sticks in the ground that were called the Asherah. And this this Asherah could spread out for a very uh, far distance, depending on how large the temple was to Baal. We, of course, don't know that from this uh, particular account here. Um, and, and then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah. Interesting, huh? He tears down the Asherah, but he uses the wood as the fire for offering the acceptable sacrifice to God himself. Verse 27, So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him, but because he was too afraid, as we saw just a moment ago, of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it uh, by night. But we have here, God requiring obedience and God requiring worship before there's any action or empowerment of Gideon to do what it was that God was preparing him and, and uh, purposefully preparing him to do. On Gideon's part, there is no question in his mind of who he's dealing with now. 
He is dealing with the angel of the Lord, God himself, who has chosen to make himself real and appearing uh, to Gideon. Now, the second, third lesson, rather, that I, I think is important for us here is that in addition to obedience in sacrifice, uh, God requires the destruction of the idols that are there. Often the Asherah poles that were set up in the in and around the, the Baal temple was at were poles that were individual poles by people who would come and offer their own Asherah, if you will. So the community was likely involved in this. And that's why Gideon is terrified. He is committing an offense that is, in their minds, worthy of death. Shouldn't have been. Shouldn't have been at all. But their people's hearts were so uh, given over to uh, Baal worship that they would have killed Gideon uh, for doing this very thing, which Gideon knows. He understands. He's not quite sure that God's able to deliver him from that, at least not just yet. Uh, but that's the fourth or the third thing I think that we see here is that before God empowers us to act, even on the things that he calls us to do, he wants and needs to know that he has our hearts, that he has uh, everything about us. The idols are destroyed. The idols in our lives that he points out to us need to be sacrificed. They need to be offered up to God that God will see and understand. The fourth and final lesson I want for us to see tonight in this particular passage is that God acts through us when we finally rest in him. Uh, John Piper uh, says and has a very famous quote in his book, Desiring God, that goes like this. God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. Before Gideon could be fully satisfied in God, God needed to work in Gideon that he would be fully, solely, completely satisfied in who God was uh, and is. Now let's turn to uh, chapter 7 in, uh, in this book. And in chapter 7 and verses 9 through 11, uh, I want us to, uh, to read these words together. So, so in the meantime, uh, God has challenged uh, Gideon with what he needs. And he's whittled down more than 10,000 soldiers that have come to fight under Gideon's leadership. He's whittled that number down to 300. That enough, when you're facing an army where those ultimately who were killed in this battle numbered 120,000, it tells us a little bit later in this account. Uh, so there were more than, those were the, just the soldiers that died. Uh, there were many more who had escaped. And so um, you, you have here God saying the same night that he tells Gideon, you have enough, 300. Arise and go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hands. And uh, But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you will hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pira, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. Gideon is still afraid. I'd be afraid too, <laughs> quite frankly. I think most of us would. The difference between Gideon and us, Gideon didn't run because of his fear. Those soldiers had already left. 
he, he goes down into the camp, just as God says, and uh, he ob obeys the Lord. It is under God's authority then that he's doing this, but he hasn't demonstrated quite yet that he is fully satisfied uh, in the Lord. And so uh, I want us to read down just a little bit further. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all of the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. And their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. And when Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, this is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. Verse 15, as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped and he returned to the camp of Israel and said, arise for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. That's the point, I believe, in this passage of Scripture that we see. Uh, Gideon, completely confident, completely satisfied that the angel of the Lord is the angel of the Lord. I haven't even mentioned the fleece and all of that. But it's in this particular point, what what God shows Gideon he's going to hear, the assurance that he needs to be the mighty man of valor that God has called him to be. Uh, he does so, and it is in those moments after seeing what God has, has already done to prepare the way for the victory uh, that, that Gideon is finally satisfied in the faith that he has been given by God to believe in this God to work in him and through him to be victorious uh, over these people. Gideon is a very human man, very flawed, very weak, just like you and I are. Uh, but he is a man who was willing to obey God he was willing to worship God. He was willing to destroy the idols in his life. And he came to a point of satisfaction in God where God was most glorified in his servant and used his servant uh, to accomplish this mighty victory over the Midianites. I don't know what God's doing in your life right now, but if God is speaking to you, if you've heard or are hearing God's voice, maybe you've heard it for a while. Maybe the Lord's been speaking to you about doing something that you're pushing back against God and saying, I can't do that, God. Like Gideon, I'm the smallest in my family. My family is the smallest in the clan. The clan is the smallest of the uh, 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 house of Manasseh. Um, Lord, I, I, I can't do it. Uh, there are just too many things working against me. And you walk away. How many people, I often ask myself this question, how many people have missed that complete satisfaction in God by pushing against, by failing to believe and obey the things that God uh, tells them to do. Uh, let me encourage you tonight to press on if you're in that place, to do as God tells you to do, obey him one step at a time. Uh, walking by faith is little more than saying yes each time 
that God says something to do that you need to do in order to become this person of God as Gideon did. Would you bow your heads with me, please, as we pray? Lord, I pray that you would take your word and seal its truths to our hearts. May there be as many messages here tonight as those who hear uh, this devotional. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to do your work in all of our lives, that we might be your people. Uh, and as uh, John MacArthur, or not John MacArthur, but um, John Piper has said, uh, Lord, know your glorification <clears throat> is uh, sufficient. You are most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in you. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you tonight.